Hi guys. In the month of May, a family member went on hospice and has since died. And also Lila had a procedure and then about a week later, she was hospitalized for around 36 hours for what we think was an infection. She's home now, she's recovering, her tail is in frame. I have to shove a pill down her throat every 12 hours. She has some anxiety issues and in the time when she was feeling crummy but wasn't really showing it, she nailed my bed a few times in a way that was uh, beyond my powers to recover. So uh, I had to order a new mattress. I've been sleeping for about a week on that couch. The one positive is that I did learn against my will, but I learned that uh, I can in fact carry a full mattress on my own down five flights of stairs. I mentioned all this at the top because death and illness aren't aberrations. To me, increasingly health seems like the real aberration. Unsurprisingly, I don't think I finished a single book in the month of May. If I did, apologies to that book because I don't remember you at all. And it's been a little weird to me not to read for almost a month because in prior times, even through death, even through sickness, through everything, I continued to read and that was kind of my one constant. I don't know what it is, but over the past few years, I've become less and less interested in convincing anybody that books in general are important. I try to organically recommend books to people in my life that I think that they'll really enjoy and I want to give Giacomo do not even think about it. Thank you. And of course I still have a powerful urge to share the books that I think are special and this channel helps me do that and I would like to get back to more written reviewing and possibly expand my outlets beyond what I could really do when I was working in publishing. I guess a point I'm trying to arrive at is that I don't care about reading books because I feel like I should or that it's part of a persona I've created or that it increases my sense of productivity. I don't read books primarily for education, although I get plenty of that along the way. I read because it fits with my brain. It does something to my brain that nothing else does. And that's my brain, right? I don't need to convince anybody else that it'll be that way for them. But I know it's this way for a lot of you. Reading is the thing that clicks. And like I said in my paltry reading goals video at the end of last year, maybe it was the very beginning of this year, I just want to read more for myself because it makes me feel like myself. But it's like with anything, once you've stopped doing something for a while, once it's no longer just a part of the way that you live, there has to be intentionality behind like reintroducing that thing. It feels really foreign at the moment to pick up a book when I could be rewatching Australia's Next Top Model, which is leaving Hulu in seven days, one on earth, best top model series around the world. To that end, I'm going to go grab a bunch of books that were orbiting around me and that I had every intention of reading soon a while ago. I have the books and I'm going to go through them. And my ultimate goal is to find one book that I'm going to start today and that I can finish hopefully in the next week. That's the goal. So a few things that I was in the middle of before May became May. Um, I was in the middle of writing a written review, writing a written review. Hopefully the review is better than that. For Grey Bees by Andrei Kurkov, translated from Russian by Boris Traliuk. I think I've heard him say his name and he said Boris instead of Boris. Kurkov is a Ukrainian writer and this was the book that he wrote about Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2014. I was sent this by Deep Vellum Press. Another book that I was almost finished at the time that everything fell apart was Afropian Notes from Black Europe by Johnny Pitts. And this is actually my final book to finish from everything that I bought in 2020. And I'm very proud of that. And this ha has such a classic travel writing feel to it while interrogating the basics of travel writing and who we assume to be a traveler, especially in Europe. I'm not gonna force myself to continue on with this right now. I think once I have a book or two under my belt, I'll be really in the swing of it and be happy to get back to this. I was 100 pages into In Memory of Memory by Maria Stepanova, translated from Russian by Sasha Dugdale. This was Russian Susan Sontag of my dreams in those first 100 pages. It really was. It's the type of book where the more you think about it, the more it rewards you for every thought that you put into it. Again, though, this isn't the exact moment to dive in. And I think I'd rather start at the beginning again, actually. So this is in a category like Afropean. Speaking of In Memory of Memory, it's one of three unread books from everything that I bought in 2021. And the other two that are remaining are Trieste by Dasha Derndich, translated from Croatian by Ellen Elias Bursach. 
and Black Earth, The Holocaust as History and Warning by Timothy Snyder. But again, it's not that I'm usually averse to reading heavy books, even when I myself am in a heavy mood, but I think I need to have the feeling of flying through a book and of actually finishing a book to get me back into things, you know? I don't really see myself flying through Black Earth. Although I have to thank my 2021 self because Look at this selection that she left me. I mean, good work. Okay, next group of contenders. I was doing so, so well at having a zero TBR for 2022, actually a negative TBR, because whatever I was reading at the moment, whenever I received a book externally, whether it was from a friend or from a publisher or one that I bought myself in the year, I would drop whatever I was doing and read that book so that it didn't become a TBR title down the line. Um, and now I have a few stockpiled. One borrowed book I haven't read yet is Claudia Pinero's Elena Knows. Elena Knows. Elena is the Italian pronunciation. This is translated from Spanish by Francis Riddle and from Argentine Spanish because this takes place in Buenos Aires. It was just shortlisted for the International Booker Prize and I was on the fence about it, but when Matthew DNF'd it and he described it to me, it pushed me over the edge. <laughs> So he gave me his copy. The only book that was sent to me from publishers that I haven't read yet this year is Lucky Breaks by Yevgenia Belorusets. She is a Ukrainian novelist and this is translated from Russian by Eugene Ostashevsky. And like with Grey Bees, this addresses Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine before February 24th of this year. I want to want to read it because I know I did so powerfully as soon as it came into my home at exactly the wrong moment. It's okay, I, I know I'm more likely to get to it if I read exactly what I want to in this moment and then get into a rhythm. How many different idioms can I use for get back into the swing of things, get into a rhythm? We'll know by the end of the video. I've bought four books this year and I've only read one of them, which is a favorite book of the year so far. And I think possibly my next video, maybe the one after that, we'll be talking about my three standout books of 2022 so far. But the other three books from 2022 that I purchased and haven't read yet, are Companion Piece by Ali Smith, Catalan Street by Mopta Sobu, translated from Hungarian by Len Rix, and Sweet Darussia, A Tale of Two Villages by Maria Matos. This is translated from Ukrainian by Michael M. Naden and Olha Titarenko. Of these three, I'm not in the mood at the moment for Sweet Darussia. I love Mogda. Love her books. Maybe this would be a good one to start with, actually or companion piece because I read Summer in a day earlier this year and this is half the size of that. This could be exactly what I need. And then I also grabbed three books from my TBR that I thought could fit the bill. The first is At Swim Two Boys by Jamie O'Neill, which was a gift last year from Matthew for my birthday. I think this is about two boys who fall in love in 1915 Ireland. That's a big one, but I don't know, I'm, feel I'm feeling it. Okay, that's in the maybe pile. Another one that I thought could have a really good chance of, wait, let's select another idiom here. Starting my engine is Sally Rooney's A Beautiful World, Where Are You? Which I was sent from the publisher at the end of last year. It's unusual for me not to have read this because I read over 90% of the books that publishers have ever sent me in my time on booktube. I've been really sparing what I've requested. I don't even know what this is about. I just think that the, the flow of her books and the effortless quality to her writing is something that is helpful for people who are struggling to read. And then this is the last T-Bar book I picked off my shelf. It's Disoriental by Nagar Javadi. This is translated from French by da, 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 Tina Cover. Oh, Tina, I follow her on Twitter. Anyway, my previous boss gave this to me right before I left my job. <laughs> Sorry, boss. I mean, she left the job soon after anyway, so greener pastures all around, but I read about 15 pages of this when she gifted it to me and loved it, but never got around to going any further. This might be the moment. Okay, in the maybe pile it goes. I'm gonna reshelve the ones I'm not reading for now and then turn to the five I chose, dip into them, and I'll come back later and tell you if I had any success. I've come back sooner than I anticipated. Sorry to pretend that any of this was suspenseful. I'm gonna read Companion Piece by Ellie Smith. Just a little bit on the dust jacket. And two of the epigraphs made me cry. So I think they're tapping into something. You did hear me correctly. I said two of the epigraphs. 
Um, no author can get away with this many, but she almost does. The dust jacket says, here we are in extraordinary times. Is this history? What happens when we cease to trust governments, the media, each other? What have we lost? What stays with us? What does it take to unlock our future? Every line I read from Czesław Miłosz's poetry makes me question my life decisions and not immediately going out and reading his poetry. There's an excerpt here that says, the mild valley of those who are eternally alive. They walk by green waters. With red ink they draw on my breast, a heart, and the signs of a kindly welcome. In the second epigraph, I might actually just start weeping, but I think that's healthy. So it's from Marilyn Robinson and it says, I'm angry to the depths of my soul that the earth has been so injured while we were all bemused by supposed monuments of value and intellect, vaults of bogus cultural riches. I feel the worth of my own life diminished by the tedious years I have spent acquiring competence in the arcana of mediocre invention. For all the world like one of those people who knows all there is to know about some defunct comic book hero or television series. The grief borne home to others while I and my kind have been thus occupied lies on my conscience like a crime. Uh, <laughs> I actually like feel really emotional about that. Um, and I didn't even know it was Marilyn when I was first reading the epigraph, so... My hero worship barely came into it at all. Yeah, my injured, tired heart needs some Allie Smith. And some Marilyn Robinson and Cheswap Milos, evidently. Thank you for spending this time with me. I'm resisting the stupid YouTuber impulse to apologize for crying. <laughs> we should all be weeping all the time, please. Nothing could be more natural. I wish you all clean mattresses in your lives. And if your mattresses are in fact soiled, I wish for you not to live alone at the top of a walk-up. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon, life permitting for another video.